meeting to order. <laughs> um, <clears throat> calling to order the meeting of our regular meeting for uh, March 23rd, 2016. Um, our first item of business is roll call. Tonight, Mr. Bjork and Mrs. Burns are unable to be present with us. The next item is, would you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'd like to ask that coming right after that, the, what's happening in the world today is just so horrifying. And we could have a moment of silence for Belgium and Brussels and all the people in the world who are dealing with the terrorists, which is actually all of us. But thank you. God bless us for living in America. We'll have a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Um, our next item of business would be the consensus agenda. Um, there are a number of them that we can do, and then we're going to take some of them separately. So we have approval of minutes March 9th, 2016, regular session. Um, we're going to do the field trip separately and the donation. Then we'll come down to warrants G417, G418, warrants R217, R218. Warrants L35, L36, L37, we'll skip payroll for now. Warrants CB12, and warrants SPED19, SPED20. Do we have a motion to accept those? Okay. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Bonish. Second, Mrs. Carroll, all those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Um, down here, warrant, payroll warrant 316, 2016. I'll entertain a motion for that one. Mr. Mulis. So moved. Okay, do we have a second? Good. Mrs. Broussard. All those in favor? No. Okay, one, two, three. Um, four in favor and no. One, two, three. Three in favor and two abstain. Mrs. Carroll and Mrs. Kane. Okay, now we'll go back up to the top. Um, the approval of the out of state field trip to Italy for February 17th, 2017. So let's say that. Do we have a motion to approve that field trip? Or did we want to make any comments on it? Or else? This, yeah, this is a field trip that's being uh, run by Mr. Indiciani for uh, February vacation of next year to Italy. And uh, you can see that there's a number of different locations that they plan to attend, and as well as the educational objectives that he's included. But uh, lots of sites in Rome, and then on to Pompeii, Sorrento. Uh, and Capri, and then back to Rome and home. They're going to love that trip. That's mm -hmm. a fabulous trip. All right, so Mrs. Bonish. So moved. So moved. Second, Mrs. Carroll. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous, Kim. All right, our next field trip would be um, one that's just come up, so we can't, we don't follow the time requirements on it. And this is approval of an out of state field trip to Nashville, Tennessee um, on April 23rd, 2016. That's right, they were not able to meet the 60 day notice because their competition was in uh, March, and so they didn't know if or how many students were actually going to advance to the nationals. But they have seven students who are going to be going to Nashville for the National DECA competition. That is fantastic. DECA has, every year, they're doing a great job with the kids. So we would move to approve the DECA competition field trip to Nashville. Mrs. Broussard. So moved. Second. Mrs. Carroll. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And we have one more field trip. Where is it? Uh, donation. Oh, a donation. OK. Um, all right. The approval of a donation funding for the Wuben Street classroom? Yes, uh, there is a website called donorschoose.org where educators can post a project that they are looking for funding for, and donors who come onto the site can actually 
choose which projects they like and which ch which projects they'd like to make donations towards. And so uh, Ms. Pimentel, who is a Woburn Street School teacher, grade one teacher, uh, had posted on this website classroom library books for eager readers, which are part, part of our literacy initiative to have uh, lots of books for kids to read. And she received a number of donations. It's on the attached, all the different folks who liked her project and funded their donation to the tune of $932.22. Since it exceeds the 500, we brought it to you for acceptance. She did a wonderful job. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay, um, I take a motion to accept the donation from donorschoose.org in the amount of $932.22. Ms. Mrs. Bonick. So moved. Second. Mrs. Carroll. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous, Kim. Thank you. All right, we did it. Okay. Oh, Dina knows her cue. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to see you again, Dina. Nice to see all of you okay. again. Um, first off, I wanted to say that Monday, spring sports started, and on Twitter, it blew up like, oh, look, first day of winter sports, no snow. First day of spring sports, we get snow. Oh. The irony. <laughs> uh, tonight, Wilmington lacrosse. Uh, when we think girls lacrosse team has a fundraiser at the local Paneras and it's still going on. So if like it's going on until 9 p.m. So if you just want to put in an order like real quick through your phone, donation goes to the Wilmington lacrosse team. Um, this year, I mean, this week is the English MCAS for sophomores. Um, it's a very grueling process because we've been taking it since third grade, but you know, Sophomores, we're mature about it. We went through it. We finished session two. Tomorrow, session three will be over and done with it. And then May is Math MCAS. So, you know, um, by now, like, there's no con conflicts with it. Everybody's just, you know, let's get it over with. It's MCAS. Let's get our high school diploma and pass it. Um, and then prom tickets have gone on sale. Exciting night for juniors and seniors, obviously. Uh, and also, now is this time of the year, uh, Mr. Mahoney is offering, you know, new spots for the next year's class advisory council. So anyone who wants to be on next year's class advisory council can go and speak to him. And that is my short and sweet speech. And how can we not forget my quote? <laughs> my quote, for some reason, does not relate whatsoever to my speech. <laughs> Why? Because um, we meet bi-weekly, and next time we meet would be in April, and March is obviously the National Woman History Month, and I couldn't, uh, you know, I wanted to include a quote from a woman that inspires me all the time, which is First Lady Michelle Obama, and the quote is, when you've worked hard and done well, and walk through the doorway of opportunity, you do not slam it shut back behind you. You reach back and you give folks the same chances that helped you succeed. I love that phrase too, doorway of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Any Thank comments you. or questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dina. That was lovely as usual. Yeah. Thank we you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Taking note of all the quotes. Put it out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Do a great job with those quotes. All right. Um, our next item of business, superintendent's report. Okay. I want to start off just with some uh, upcoming. Well, actually, I'll go back in time here. As uh, as Dina mentioned, Grade 10 MCAS did happen for ELA this week. So just acknowledge that. Next week and in the fall into the following week will be the ELA MCAS for grades three through eight. Uh, last night, um, myself and, and a couple of school committee members mm -hmm. attended the pre-prom activity. Very well attended, packed mm -hmm. house for sure. Uh, Chief Bagonis sp spoke uh, for a little bit about particularly social host liability. And then we had a guest, guest speaker, Jeff Allison, who many of you are probably familiar with, a former uh, professional baseball player who grew up in Peabody, who had his own personal struggles with substance use disorder, substance abuse, uh, very um, impactful talk about his life experiences. So I just want to thank 
Doreen Crow, Chris Phillips, the Wildcat Project Committee, the SAD Club and SAD Advisors, as well as the Wilmington Board of Health, uh, Shelley Newhouse, who provided some funding for, towards the speaker as well. So mm -hmm. thanks to all those folks for organizing it. I know it's been a year or two since we had that, so I'm glad that we have that back on the agenda again for our students and parents. It certainly uh, should have been a great way to mm -hmm. have conversation with the mm -hmm. children. Yes. Not children anymore, but young adults and their parents. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of upcoming dates, March 31st, that's next Wednesday, Title I Family Literacy Night, which is going to be here at the high school at 6.30 p.m. On April 1st, so it's a little bit early this year, the Wilmington Middle School Tech Fair that uh, was sponsored by Analog Devices. Uh, and on April 7th, the annual Employee Health and Benefits Fair at Town Hall from 1 to 4.30. And uh, even though you don't get paid, I would say, given your role, if you guys wanted to stop by, you're part of our, our community as well. Okay. So um, the kindergarten registration was last week. And uh, at this point, our kindergarten registration numbers are 132 students registered at Wildwood and 85 students registered at Boutwell. Typically, they pick up another 20 students between registration and the beginning of the school year. So if that held, if that held this year, probably at Wildwood, we might have a little bit of, of a of constraint there. We may have some high class sizes. So we're looking into different options, including adding an additional class, being able to add additional class to get the class sizes down. Um, depends on what happens at the Boutwell. If they pick out as many students or don't, we might be able to shift uh, a staff member from one school to the other. Um, the other alternative that, that we may need to discuss, and it will, it will have some policy implications for the school committee, is the option to do some spot redistricting of students at the Wildwood over to the Boutwell side of, of Wilmington. So we're going to keep our eyes on it. and. Uh, maybe make some policy recommendations in advance yeah. in case we need to do that with respect to spot redistricting. Uh, and if we need to invoke that you know, as the numbers increase, we'll certainly have that option available to us. So we're happy that we have we're so interested in Wilmington Public Schools, but uh, again, those numbers are, are creeping up there. I also wanted to update you to let you know that the World War II trip is coming up uh, for April vacation. And I'm sure that there is, and I know that there's been some concerns about what the agenda is, the itinerary of the trip, and how the recent events in Brussels impacts our agenda. Um, Ms. Tucker actually reached out to the travel company one stop that they did have on their agenda was in the uh, city of Bastogne, which is in Belgium. It's not in Brussels, but it's, it's in Belgium. They have adjusted their itinerary, and they are no longer going to stop and stay over in that city. They're instead going to spend an extra night in Germany. So they will have to travel through Belgium, close to Belgium, but they're not going to actually stop or stay in Belgium anywhere. Um, the cities they are visiting, just so you know, include things like, uh, let's see, they're going to be visiting um, Krakow, Poland, Berlin, Normandy, Paris, amongst other places. But they will stay clear of, of Belgium, so it'll be a nice trip. So. We appreciate uh, Ms. Tucker's attention to the safety and security of students and staff, for sure. So, Does anyone have any questions or comments about it? I don't have a question about oh, the field trip, but could we percent. just go back to the hours for the tech fair at the middle school? Yes. Uh, I believe it's all day. Okay. 7.30, 7 .30. 7 .30 to 1 o'clock. To 1 o'clock. And is there a preferred one. time for visitors? Oh, you can go any time. They, they have right. their classes in there that day. Yeah. I read there was a preferred time, like between... Um, 10 and 11.30 or something like that. I read okay. somewhere. It might, maybe it was I on their website. look into that just and send you all an email and give you that information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then the final uh, item that I wanted to share with the committee is that uh, yesterday I made an offer to uh, Timothy Alberts as our new Director of Athletics, Physical Education, and Health. Uh, this morning, he accepted that offer, 
and we will begin contract negotiations for that position in, in hopes of having him signed on by April 1st and with a July 1 start date. So. And that's my report. I just want to say it's so ironic that you'd be here tonight <laughs> when this is bittersweet, bittersweet for us. Thank you. Okay, old business, none. New business, certificate of commendation for Brian Sh Shell. Brian Shell. Yes. And Brian is here with us today, as you may know. Brian actually is uh, coaches many sports here, uh, all seasons. Uh, in the fall, you're the cross country. Is that correct? Right. Uh, and in the winter, coaches the high school uh, girls track coach. And we're here, we've asked him to come here tonight so as, because the school committee wanted to present to you a certificate of commendation for uh, receiving the All Scholastic Award as the Division Four Girls Track Coach of the Year. So we thank you, of course, for your commitment and your dedication to our students and for a job well done. Congratulations. Yes, we have a certificate here for you. Thoughts or comments? No. We really appreciate the time and effort that you give to the these teams in Wilmington, and I'm sure they're better for having had you as a coach. They're hard workers. Oh yes, yes. I know. Uh, obviously, I know. I worked with boys and the girls teams in particular. I know. Um, the girls team in particular, I know, again, we always talk, we talked about it last week when we had our coaches, parent meeting and everything, they are student athletes and I know the girls team in particular, and boys as well, they're actually one if not the, you know, the smartest kids in the school, their GPAs that we know of, you know, they, they don't just work hard here in, in track, they work hard in the classroom as well and, you know, to see that, you know, they go through the days here doing everything they need to do in the classrooms and then, you know, giving me their full effort at, at practice as well is, is just amazing from them. So it's just, it, you know, it's awesome that they, you know, they, they work hard and, they, you know, they, they too got rewarded this season with, you know, their first ever championship. So it was, it was great for them. They all worked on it. And I know uh, we just mentioned that we had, you know, the, uh, the Women's History Month. And, you know, today we just had two girls that were nominated for the, uh, the women's, uh, girls and women's in sports, uh, developing new leaders and such, and then they had that today at the Faneuil Hall. I know uh, Samantha Pitsy and Julia Gake were um, both in the track team, and again, very well, again, not just in the classroom, but in the sports as well, so it's, it's great to have them. They're, they're awesome kids, all of them. Wow, that's fantastic. Thanks, Thank you, I appreciate it. No, appreciate the uh, accommodation here, the certificate. This is, means a lot to me, I know. Hopefully more to come for you, you know, Rep represent, represent the school, represent Wilmington. Uh, you know, obviously I'm a graduate myself here, and I even had uh, Ed here as one of my teachers, as a phys ed teacher uh, my senior year, so, oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely good to, you know, br bring some, uh, bring some uh, championships to Wilmington and hopefully more to come. So again, thank you, appreciate it, it means yeah. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, um, our next item of business is winter athletic sports wrap up. If you want to come to the mic or that mic, whatever you're more comfortable with, just right here. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin with our winter summary. Uh, girls basketball, coached by uh, Bree Carroll, had Carolyn and Anderson as our uh, Middlesex League All Star. Cheerleading, we had uh, Coach Nicole Mankella French uh, place first in the Middlesex League uh, meet at Central Catholic. Boys ice hockey, coached by Steve Scanlon, uh, made it back to the, uh, the tournament this year. They lost in the second round of the tournament uh, to Arlington, which was the uh, number one seed. Middlesex League All-Star was Brian Cavanaugh. Girls ice hockey coach, uh, Mike Goudreau had Olivia Wingate as a uh, Middlesex League All-Star. Uh, wrestling, uh, coached by Joel McKenna, 
Uh, Fox Maxwell uh, won the Division Three North Championship at 138 pounds. We had Sam Jennings at 170 and James Carroll at 195. Uh, qualify the, uh, for the Division Three North State Tournament at the sectionals. All right, congratulations, Mom. <laughs> All right. Uh, in the uh, boys went to track. We had uh, Coach uh, Mike Kenny, had Middlesex League All Stars Evan Sperlanga, Devin Langenfeld, and Kyle Nelson. And as we just heard, our girls uh, went to track. Coach uh, uh, by Brian Schnell won the Middlesex League Championship. Obviously, the very first one ever. All right, and Brian, as you know, was a uh, Boston Globe All Scholastic Coach of the Year, which is uh, which is very good. Uh, for the uh, Middlesex League All Stars, Alyssa uh, Bernazzini, we had Victoria Sheehan, Sam Pitsy, uh, Alexia Luna, Elizabeth Olson, and uh, Julia Gate. So, congratulations to those girls. Uh, I'd also like to uh, Brian kind of uh, mentioned the uh, Girls and Women in Sport uh, Day, which was today at Daniel Hall, sponsored by the MIAA. This was originally scheduled for February 5th, but uh, Boston, once they call school off, uh, nothing happens in Boston. So uh, it was postponed to today. Uh, this is a statewide celebration. Uh, Wilmington was represented by the two three-sport athletes, as Brian mentioned, Julia Gake, uh, who is uh, volleyball, winter track, and spring track. Uh, Samantha Pitsy does soccer, winter track, and spring track. Uh, their mums, Krista Gake and uh, Dee Dee Pitsy, were also invited to the ceremony. All right, uh, so both girls are also in the top 20 academically in, in, uh, in their senior class. So uh, the girls and the mums uh, had a great day today. Okay. Uh, worked out, it was great. It was absolutely great. And the last thing I'd like to uh, talk about is the summer clinics. Oh, can I just, I just oh, wanted sure. to uh, interject something. I just, um, I'm aware that one of the challenges that we had this year in winter sports too was uh, the girls' hockey team, particularly the challenge of finding a goalie, if I'm not corrected. And I yeah. think I just want to give a shout out to Jamie Spinazzola oh. because she stepped in. She'd never played, never played goalie. that goalie. Yeah. She'd and she not actually, really a she hockey player. She actually did extremely well. I mean, yeah. you, you watched the play, you, you would have thought that she had, I mean, you, you put that hockey gear on, it puts another 60, 70 pounds on, yeah. you know, and to be able to, you know, move around with that, you know, is, uh, it was exceptional. She did an absolutely great job. But it was, as uh, Mary will tell you, uh, those two months leading up to the uh, start of the season uh, was tough. Tough, you know. Parents had, you know, good uh, information. They, you know, they wanted to protect the team and protect the kids and all that. But Jamie Spinazzola stepped up for us and did a fantastic job. And I think, you know, it's exactly the type of risk taking that we try to promote amongst our students. Uh, and regardless of what the season, what the record was for the season, uh, what I took away from it is that when it came time for Jamie to write her college essay, and she. Um, accused her mom of their family having too normal a, night, a life such that she had nothing to write about. Her mom reminded her about the hockey season and she wrote about how it, what, what it was like to take that risk on and to feel successful about it and yeah. I think that's exactly what we, what we look to promote in our kids, those, that resilience and that risk taking and yeah. you know, good for her. So. Yeah. And they actually, um, you know, like I said, they did you know, better at the end of the season. You know, they started, uh, they were, you know, they did lose a couple of one, uh, one goal games, but they also uh, won a couple at the end. So it was, it was, uh, you know, it was they a got better. good ending. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, now we get to the, uh, you know, the fun and games here with the uh, summer sports clinics. Um, I'm here basically to ask if there's any, you know, if you have any questions regarding, you know, the summer clinics this year. Um, I'm sure you have the sheet there. We are going to try to add another camp this year. We're going to try, uh, now that we're back at the high school, or I think it's the first time we've been at high school. We were in high school for basketball in a couple of camps way back when, but the last six or seven years we've been over at the middle school. So it's, uh, it's going to be great to have everything right here. But we are going to try to offer track this year, uh, coincide with volleyball. Volleyball obviously will be in the gym, track will be outside. So, uh, like I said, I'd like to 
If we get the okay, I'd like to, to start to run these off and bring them over to the school so they can send them home. Will the, will the track include some of the um, spring throwing type things or not? Oh, yeah. For, we're going to try to do as much as we can. I know you were saying that you, yep. that's some place where you're looking to build the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll have a lot of those girls and boys that are mm -hmm. from the high school, they'll be there, nice. you, know, to, Great. you know, to run the programs with them. What happens if it rains for the track? Will they be able to use the indoor track, or will they? Well, yeah, we'll definitely work something out with the uh, with the indoors. You know, I know um, the volleyball will be at the gym. The so. volleyball will be in the gym. They could use up top. You know, we'll try to you know make some accommodations. Maybe we got to do anything in the cafeteria or something just to you know make keep make it happen. Is right. <laughs> yeah, but we don't we don't think rain. We don't I think know. That way. <laughs> That's the last. But the um. The amount that we charge seems very reasonable. Do we ever have back, uh, you know, people upset that we spending we charge too much, or uh, are we in there so with everyone else? On the contrary, else? I have more people come to me and say this is the best daycare that they've ever had. Okay. All right, because a lot of people are paying four or five hundred dollars a week, mm -hmm. you know, for daycare, you know, and the, the the kids love it because we have the high school kids with them who they think they're gods for whatever reason, <laughs> all right? And they, I mean, and those kids, there's a lot of the kids that do the camps that you have to actually watch them because they're excellent with the young kids. It's, it's amazing, That's it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And they look up to them, you know, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's a great way some of the kids obviously get paid. Uh, uh, a lot of kids get community service, you know, but, uh, it just, like I said, it just works out, you know. Excellent. Thank yes. you. Do you think you'll do any of the basketball outside at the, in the outside? Uh -huh. Yeah, we do because of the numbers that we had. Okay. We'll um, put them out in the basket like we did when we were in the old school, when we had the old tennis courts and basketball. Yeah. We had them out there. We put, um, we had the portables at eight feet high for the, you know, for the six to eight-year-olds. Okay. So we, we plan on doing, you know, that also. So we'll be using you know, the courts, indoor and, out, and outdoors. Excellent. Yeah. Any other? So, thank you very much. Oh. That was great, Ed. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So we're all set. You can start sending them out. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Good night. Good Thanks for coming. Good night. Take care. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, new business D, revolving accounts. Superintendent DeLay. I am going to turn this one over to Mr. Ruggiero. Thank you. Uh, in front of you, you have a, a revolving, uh, revolving account as of March 14th. Um, if you looked at the numbers, you'll see some of them, a lot of them are in the, in the red. It's really a timing issue. Um, the revenues are entered by the school system but posted by the town after they reconcile bank statements. So uh, expenditures are up to date through the middle of March, but the revenues have been posted only through November. So it's kind of a mismatch there. So that's why some of the numbers look like they're, some of the revolving accounts look like they're um, in the red, if you will, but that'll all clear, be cleared out. And, uh, matter of fact, the town posted December today. They, they contacted me, so they'll catch up. And, and I've been in contact with the town. So but we should have no issues as we go through the rest of the year. And I'll keep you informed as we go through the rest of the school year. Okay, any questions? I was just gonna say at one point, I remember when we had to um, charge more for CARES and we haven't done that for a long time now. Mm -hmm. We're a very well, very well run mm -hmm. organization. And I know she, she's shy to come here, mm -hmm. but um, I'm hoping between now and the end of the year we can have sure. Jeannie come and yeah. Yeah. tell us about what, what she's doing, because she's doing something really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's opened up some programs at the middle school, and she's doing a great job there. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have her. That would be great. Thank you. Anything else? We're all set? Okay, thank you very much. And um, new business E S. WPBS presentation, okay. Superintendent. I'm actually going to go over to the other side so I can okay. operate the laptop. We included in your packet 
packet for the school committee meeting an article called School-Wide Positive Behavior Supports, written by several authors, one of whom was George Sugai. George Sugai is the, essentially the, the founder of what we know now as school-wide PBS or PBIS, the I stands for interventions, positive behavior and interventions, uh, positive behavior interventions and supports. Uh, George Sugai is actually going to be a keynote speaker at an upcoming the Blue Ribbon Institute on April 15th, in, which is in Reading, Massachusetts. So we're going to send a number of staff to hear that presentation. Certainly, if anybody's interested, we could probably make that arrangement as well if you're interested in attending uh, that day. It's actually part of a full day sharing conference, educator sharing conference uh, that, that Reading hosts each year. And with this article has been read by a significant number of folks within the Wilmington Public Schools. It's been read by all of the district leadership team. It's been read by the members of the Behavioral Health Task Force, the members of the Inclusion Task Force, and then the entire middle school staff as part of a staff meeting read the article and used a text-based protocol to discuss uh, what this would look like if it were implemented. Pretty much across the board in all of our schools, uh, everybody has acknowledged that this is a, a critical component of addressing the behavioral needs of students. So I'm going to run through this presentation. It's kind of a summary of this article, more for the community as well, so they can understand the direction that we're going in with respect to uh, PBIS. And what I wanted to do was actually start by showing you a video clip and uh, I'm going to cut it off after about seven minutes or so. But uh, this is George Sugai himself talking about school-wide positive behavior supports. Oops. Maybe I won't be. We might skip George talking. I mean, for some reason, the video doesn't yet not seem to have been seem to load up. Um, the thing that is important to recognize about this, and we'll talk about it some more about PBIS, is that it is it's complex and it takes a long time to implement. It's not something that we're just going to snap our fingers first day of school next year and say, okay, we're there and it's done. It's going to take us some time to implement, and we'll talk about the steps, but. Uh, sometimes the, you know, the simple things may take a short amount of time, but this is complex and it's going to take us a while to get exactly where we want to go. And we want to make sure that we do this in a thoughtful manner. So PBIS is one aspect of what we call tiered systems of support, multi-tiered systems of support. And I'll show you a graphic in a, in a, a little bit that will make it, uh, I think, even clearer. But essentially what this, what this tiered system of support means is that we are trying to improve students' academic outcomes as well as their behavioral outcomes. And if you visualize this sort of as, as a triangle, tier one are those supports, academic and behavioral, that we provide to all students. And if done properly and if those tier one supports are strong, those tier one supports address the needs of 80 to 90 percent of the student population. So you're addressing the academic and behavioral needs. It's a, it's a framework. It's not an initiative. It's not a program. It's really a, f a framework for how we address the needs of students and how we achieve the outcomes that we're looking for, the academic outcomes and the behavioral outcomes. It's a decision-making framework that helps guide the steps that we take as students present with different challenges, it's a decision-making process about what are we going to bring to the table to support the needs of students who perhaps are not having their needs met at the tier one and need higher levels of support. So what helps students be successful? This is research evidence-based. Knowing what is expected of them, that's pretty critical. Hearing a clear and consistent message, clear and consistent messages. Having friendly reminders in case they forget. 
being recognized for doing well and having help ready if and when they need it. So we translate multi-tiered systems to support. What do we mean? We essentially mean a group of people who are making decisions about what the school stands for. Those are your norms or your core values and how it operates. So how do those norms and core values get translated into, how do they get operationalized? How do they get translated into behavioral expectations? So as this set of questions asks, the first question is what do we want, what do we stand for? So what are our core values, what are our norms? How do we teach the behavior that we expect, those behaviors being aligned to those norms and core values? How do we teach the behavior that we want all students to demonstrate? How do we acknowledge when the students have behaved in that way? How do we acknowledge them? That's the positive part of the positive behavioral supports. What do we do consistently and predictably, predictably when there's unexpected behaviors? How do we handle those situations? And also, how do we collect and analyze and interpret the data that tells us, are we successful? What are the outcomes we're looking for? How we measure them? What's the data that we collect? to see that we're on track and that we're actually achieving the outcomes that we set out to achieve in both the academic and the behavioral domains. So here's the triangle that I talked about, and I think this is a really good graphic. This is the classic tiered system of support triangle. And what you see on the bottom in the green, those are the tier one supports. Those are universal interventions, things that we do every day in our schools, in our classrooms, in the different settings, and if done right, and if done well, address the needs preventatively, proactively, of 80 to 90% of our students. And you see one side is the academic interventions and supports, and one side is the behavioral, but it's still all part of the same triangle. There are always going to be some students, and the article talks about the fact that at different grade levels, for example, at the elementary school, you typically have a higher level of compliance with these tier one supports than you would, say, at the middle school and the high school. But in any case, you're always going to have a population of students who, at any given time, are going to struggle to meet those academic or those behavioral expectations, and they're going to need what's called more intensive services. So that's what tier two or secondary interventions are intended to address. That five or 10 percent of students who are not responding well with just the tier one stuff we do every day to be consistent about our expectations, they need a little bit more. I think about things like uh, collaborative and proactive problem solving, the Ross Green uh, work that we do with students where we actually engage them in a dialogue when they're having trouble meeting expectations and talk to them about a mutually agreeable solution for how to address those challenges. When we get to that third tier, those are students who are, have even more of a challenge. So even with that second tier of supports, they still are having difficulty meeting the expectations, either academically or behaviorally, and they need these sort of high intensity, very individualized tier, tertiary or tier three supports. So that's the basics of MTSS, and when we talk about PBIS or school-wide PBS, we're talking about that as being the behavioral tier one intervention. So the right side of that triangle, the green, that if we do this, this well, we will support the needs behaviorally of 80 to 90. Now obviously that also has an impact on uh, academic performance, because if students are able to behave well, um, and meet the behavioral expectations, that's also going to help their academic performance. So primary tier, tier one, that's what we're calling universal, that's all synonymous for these tier one interventions. So the steps that we would take to implement school-wide PBIS as a primary tier intervention is identify the meaningful outcomes. What are those metrics and measures that we are going to use to identify whether or not behavioral needs are being met? So when you think about that, you think about things like attendance. You want a strong amount of attendance. You don't want kids absent excessively. You look at discipline, and there's multiple measures of discipline. There's the office discipline referrals when a behavior can't be managed in the classroom and a child gets sent to the office. There are suspensions in school and out of school. There are expulsions as well. So measuring discipline and then looking to improve the disciplinary rates. 
Uh, there are um, assessment results, whether it be the state assessment results or, or benchmark assessments that we offer. Obviously, the behavioral supports have an impact on academic achievement. So there's all sorts of measures that we're looking at to identify what we're going to measure to monitor the progress. We then establish and invest in the school-wide systems. Those are the norms that we talked about and the behavioral expectations. So we establish what that looks like. We also establish, in terms of systems, uh, re positive reinforcement systems. How do we positively reinforce students when they behave the way we want them to behave? And there's a lot of evidence that says that the cycle of sort of you misbehave and then there's a consequence administered and then you misbehave and a consequence typically doesn't solve the underlying behavioral issue that's the, the, the whatever the challenge is that's causing the behavior to happen. So we put in positive supports so that students are positively rewarded when they meet the uh, behavioral expectations that we've set. We also uh, implement evidence-based based practices. This is how we teach the, the children what it is we want them to know. If we want to, at the very beginning of the school year, if we want to make sure that children wash their hands every time they go to the bathroom, that has to be explicitly taught as one of the expectations, what does that look like? If we want them to walk in a line quietly in the corridor, we have to explicitly teach that. And so certainly that's, it's grade level developmentally appropriate, not teaching high school kids how to perhaps walk in line down the hallway. But there are other th expectations that do have to be taught explicitly. And then we collect and we use the data to make decisions. If we find that the things we're doing are not having the impact we thought on, say, discipline, let's look at what's going on. Let's collect some more data. So let's look at where the students are having difficulty meeting expectations. If it's in the cafeteria, then let's, you know, take some measures to improve the supervision in the cafeteria. Let's do some additional explicit instruction around cafeteria expectations, for example. So a very data-informed, um, thoughtful uh, approach. So how do we know if we're ready to do this work? Again, I mentioned this is going to take several years. There are some steps that we need to take in order to before we can even talk about implementing the positive behavioral supports in our schools. First, each school really needs to have a team, and a team that works well together, and a team that's representative of the many different disciplines and functions in a school. So it could be guidance in school psych, an educational assistant, classroom teachers, and even a parent to represent the family engagement piece of the, the puzzle. Uh, it, identify a team member, sometimes Districts also use a, a, an outside consultant who has expertise in this area that will serve as a coach, somebody who has the wealth of knowledge to be able to coach, the pro, to coach them through the process. We have to make sure that all the staff in the building understand and agree that this is something that we're all going to do as just part of every day, what the business that we do to support students in terms of behaviors then we have to have a data system that actually facilitates the data collection and the data entry and, and gives us the reports we want so that we can visually see how we're doing very quickly. And the team, the school-wide positive behavior support team, needs to engage in some tra training. They need to have a high level of expertise. Implementing the primary tier interventions themselves. So once we have this team in place and the team has been trained and we've identified the data that we're going to collect and that we're going to measure and monitor, then we can start talking about actually in putting the systems into place. So we want to establish positively stated expectations, define those expectations in terms of what they look like in various settings. So what is you know, if you pick responsibility as one of your core values, what does that look like in the classroom? What does that look like on the bus? What does that look like in the bathroom, the hallway, the gym class, the art class? Really being explicit about what those things look like, behaviors look like. We develop scripted lesson plans to teach the expectations. And oftentimes, as you know, within the two, first two to three weeks of the school year, that's when routines and structures, and structures are taught. So these lessons would be offered at a pretty high intensity at the early part of the school year, but also could be offered as reminders during the course of the school year as well. Uh, part of PBIS is increasing active supervision. That doesn't mean adding more staff. It means that the people that are in the classroom or in the setting 
do things that are more active. So they walk around the classroom and they basically call on students differently and, and survey the, the climate in the classroom differently. So it's more about what they're doing, not the number of people. You establish strategies for how you're going to acknowledge appropriate behavior, maybe systems of rewards. Uh, one of the schools that we looked at in the area, they gave out, ironically, they gave out their, um, their uh, mascot is a uh, uh, wildcat. Yeah, it's a wildcat. And they, but it's a different school district, but it's just for that school. And they give out paws. So when students, they get stickers that have paws. And so when you're caught doing something right, you get a paw. And the goal is, is to continuously reward the positive behavior, not to ignore the, the not positive behavior, the negative behavior, but unless you continuously reward students for what you expect them to do, that somehow gets lost and, and the focus just becomes on the negative behavior, not the positive behavior. So that acknowledgement piece is important. We also have strategies to respond to the inappropriate behaviors. And it's a continuum of strategies. And part of that is what are the, what, what are the staff in the building going to agree are what we call minor behaviors, minor infractions. And we agree that those things are handled in the classroom. So a student is tapping their pencil incessantly on the table and the desk, and I hear that all the time. That's a minor behavior that's dealt with in the classroom. That doesn't get you sent to the office. You know, maybe throwing something in the classroom gets you sent down to the office. Um, developing a staff reinforcement system as well. So you want teachers to encourage teachers to give out the positive incentives and positive rewards. And those who are giving out a lot means that they're doing something right in their classroom and we want to recognize them as well. And then develop the action plan to guide the rollout and then finally implement. So all these steps have to be taken. And we're still at the level of establishing the school-wide support, the, the teams. We're still trying to identify what data we currently collect and what data we need to collect if we don't already collect it to monitor our success. And we're just starting to have conversations about school-wide norms and school-wide values. It's next year that we'll begin to develop the, the expectations. And between now and next year, we hope to train a significant number of the staff who are involved in these school-wide PBS teams. So once we implement, it's not over, right? It's a continuous cycle of monitoring and making sure that you're implementing these things with fidelity and that they're effective. So we've got to continue to have these PBS teams, which in most buildings are their leadership teams. Every building has a leadership team. And this has just sort of become a function of that leadership team that they will monitor this data uh, that they have decided to look at to measure the success and the fidelity of implementation. Share that data with faculty at staff meetings, whenever opportunities on you know, multiple times during the year to see where they're at and make any changes in implementation. Celebrate the successes with both the students and the staff and share successes with parents and other community members. And one of the things we would like to do when we fully implement this, for example, is you know, say we decide as a different school wants to give out paws or they give out cards, you know, silver cards, gold cards. If I get a card because I've done really well, maybe I can go to uh, McDonald's and I can get a free, you know, hamburger. Or maybe I can go to someplace and whatever, but that the community is involved as well. So it really is a community-based initiative to reward positive behaviors. This is what, this is an example of a, what we call a behavior matrix. So what this does is, is, is it's just a piece of the matrix, but this particular district chose pride, responsibility, and the third one is respect as their core values, their school-wide norms. On the top, what you see is all the different settings you have in a school, the, the library, the auditorium, the, the bathrooms, the cafeteria. And in the matrix Excel, in itself is where you see the behaviors aligned to that norm. So for the hallway and stairway, pride means keep your hands and feet and objects to yourself and use a quiet voice. Now when you look at everything on this, when you distill it down, there are actually, it looks like 30 different expectations, but they're actually repeated throughout. So there's a very narrow set of expectations 
but they're applied to the correct setting. So use your quiet voice is also in the classroom, it's in the calf, it's at the water bubbler, it's at the bus stop, in the locker room, you see that repeated throughout, but not everything is repeated everywhere. But any particular setting only has five to six max, and oftentimes less, particular expectations. And these classroom expectations that you see, for example, are posted in every classroom. The ones for the CAF are posted in the CAF, and they're very consistent posters that are available. And that way, when I'm a student, if I'm in Mrs. Jones' classroom or I'm in Mr. Smith's classroom, it's the same set of expectations. What we see now is that every classroom has a different set of expectations. And if I'm a student, particularly at the middle school level, and I switch classes, you know, seven different teachers, seven different settings, I have a different set of, I have to remember, oh, in this classroom, you know, I need to turn in my homework on time and I always have to have my pencil, but in this classroom, it's more important that I actually use a quiet voice and do something else. So it's very inconsistent and it's difficult for students to manage all those expectations. So what this does is really lim narrows the focus um, and defines, as a school, this is what we all agree to is acceptable behavior. This type of change takes time. It's going to take us a while to get through all of this. And we have to respect that some people are, are in very different places uh, in terms of their understanding and in terms of their acceptance. It's a very different approach. Uh, you know, we tend to have a reliance on the traditional disciplinary methods of you violate the rule, you, there's a consequence. I'm not saying that we're not going to have consequences when there's violations of rules but the approach here is more to try to focus on the pause. Let's set people up for success, not set them up for failure, and these are systems that set them up for success. So you know, the conversation with administrators has been respect where your building is at, provide them with the education, get their acceptance, get their buy-in. If it takes a little bit longer for them to understand why it's important, maybe we take them out and we show, we bring them to some other school districts and see it in action. Where you see some, some videos, there's lots of videos that see it in action and you start to understand. Maybe they wait for some other schools and see what the results in some schools are and say, this is, has been incredi incredibly successful in this school. Uh, it's not that it's a, um, a choice whether we're going to do it or not, but it's a respect of the process that it takes, the time that it takes to put these in, and not just snap our fingers and expect everybody to just be doing that. So if we do these things well, what can we expect? Well, more students will learn the skills that will help them be successful, right? We'll spend a lot less time responding to unexpected or problematic behaviors and a lot more time on academics and fun. And it, you saw in the, in the article that you read that districts who have implemented school-wide PBS have shown on average they gain about 15 and a half days of administrator time by having these systems in place and 76 days of student instructional time regained because they're not having to lose time to stop instruction and deal with problematic behaviors. We'll also be able to identify students who need some extra supports and plan and provide those interventions to them. The f goal, the first goal of this in the first couple years is those tier, those tier one supports. I do believe that by the end of, not maybe next year, but the following year, every school will have those strong tier one supports in place. And as folks get the tier one supports in place and the data shows that we really have sufficiently addressed the needs of 80 to 90 percent of the school's population with those tier one interventions, then we go on to really beef up and deal with those tier two. It's not that we're not going to do anything at tier two, but then we're going to have a really strong focus on making sure that those interventions are really strong and then moving on to tier, up to tier three as well. And that is the, the research-based process for implementation of this so what are the three most, empower, most powerful tools for managing behavior? Again, this is evidence-based. The relationships we share with our students. And as you know, this year we, in the fall, did an exercise called relationship mapping, where we took the rosters at all schools and teachers identified which students they had strong, positive relationships with and which students they had concerns about. And it was 
very insightful to, and, and it really helped us to identify kids who might not have a lot of strong positive relationships with adults in the building and that was something that we could very easily find out and then do something about very quickly and make sure that each child had a sufficient number of adults that they were, could relate to in the building. Um, we will do that again in the fall of next year and we will also do it in the spring of next year as a pre-post. An engaging classroom. This, this is part of what we do is focus on engaging classrooms. It, we, I know that some of you went to see the Chromebooks in use. That's the type of engagement we're talking about. If the classroom is a fun environment and learning is active and it's happening, you're going to reduce those problematic behaviors anyway. So we look to continue improving instructional practice, particularly focused on student engagement. And a predictable and consistent learning environment. And this is where the positive behavioral supports and those expectations come into place. You can predict what's expected of you, it's consistent from setting to setting and from classroom to classroom, and it sets you up for success. So what are the greatest barriers? Competing initiatives. That's what we have to deal with in education, competing initiatives. At the district level, at the building level, at the individual level. Uh, what you will find in our strategic plan, if you dive back in, is that that strand around safe and supportive environments, uh, and even the strand around um, you know, educational uh, opportunities and, and, and instruction, all a lot of focus on MTSS. So for the ex equity and excellence in education, we focus on the academic side of that triangle. And for safe and supportive schools, we're focused on the behavioral side. And you see MTSS and PBAS all through that over the three years, understanding that it is a multi-year implementation process. So we hope to defend against this barrier of competing initiatives by the very fact that it's so prominent in our strategic plan that we are committing to say we're not going to let these other competing initiatives push this off the forefront because it's that important. Uh, so it is a priority for us over the next five years. It's a priority at least for the next three years because it shows up in our strategic plan and we've already been working quite a bit on this this year, as you can tell. Um, when we have competing initiatives, a good thing to do is to focus on practices, not programs. So school-wide PBS, it isn't really a program. It's a practice. It's a practice of making expectations clear and rewarding students for positive expected behaviors. There are other areas where there are positive behavioral supports that we provide as well. And so instead of focusing on is it this program or is it that program, it is just the practice of supporting positive behaviors in schools. I like this line. When everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So it's going to take us some time. We're really investing in our future, but we're doing it thoughtfully. Uh, it's not unlike what we do sometimes with implementation of, of curriculum, right? When we did the uh, Envisions program, we started with a pilot. We had some teachers use it. We had some teachers say, wow, this is really great. We had teachers go into their those teachers' classrooms and see what was happening and kind of get excited about the program. So this is not unlike how we would do a rollout of any other uh, program that we would do, which is just to get people excited, get, help them understand how it's going to help them be able to work more efficiently and effectively, and then spread that practice. And that's it for the presentation. I just, I really just wanted to make you aware that the work that we talk about in the strategic plan around tiered systems of support, behavioral interventions and support is underway and people are very excited about it. I was at a middle school staff meeting and they read this text as a group and when we sort of surveyed the crowd for consensus on how they felt about this, um, we used something that we do oftentimes in school which we, called, we, which we call fist to five. It's kind of a voting technique. If you hold up five fingers, it means you're, you're on board, you're, you're up for it, you're into it, this is great. If you do a fist, that's a way of locking consensus and saying, I cannot live with this whatsoever. And of course, you know, anything between from fist to five. And I will tell you that the vast majority of the staff at the middle school had the fives, the fours, maybe saw a few threes. And I think that was just more about trepidation and anxiety around what does this mean for me in terms of level of effort, perhaps. 
Um, but people are excited and people see how this could be very impactful in their schools. Thank you. That was very yeah. good. This is Bruce said. Two questions that I think are kind of related as it applies to this. The first is, I'm under the impression that we have a couple of, I don't want to call them programs, but an, we have a couple of things going on at different buildings. Uh, Shawshin had the keys to a better me at one point. Uh, I think it was the West had the pride cards that they did, and the middle school does the four R's. Are those initiatives still in the works, and will they be built upon and continued, or will they be scrapped and something else done? So the, the schools that have those things in place feel that those things have, are somewhat out of date and have not really been refreshed. Uh, the exception being the middle school. I think the middle school really likes the four R's, so they will re-examine that and decide whether they want that to be the, the foundation moving forward. If they, they just want to you know, validate that, yes, those are the three or four, um, I think the one they struggle with is results because they don't necessarily see that as a core value, but certainly responsibility, respect, resilience, they really love those. So they will probably have those, as I would imagine, as a school I don't quite possibly. Uh, the other <laughs> schools feel like pride. If you look at what the P and the R and the I and the D, thing, I was industriousness. And I think people feel that that's probably not you know, exactly what they're thinking about now around core values and, and, uh, and school-wide norms. So they're all re-examining those. And they're doing that process with staff. But they're also doing it with students. The Sharshin actually engaged students. They watched a video on mindset and changing your mindset involving Steve Jobs. And those who don't know, Steve Jobs had significant learning disabilities and yet you know, was able to achieve such greatness. Um, and the st students have been involved in the conversation around what, do, what, do we, what are our school-wide beliefs and what do we look for from one another. So those conversations are, are happening. So I guess it's an opportunity for them to re-examine. And I think that those things that were happening were not necessarily happening with regularity, consistency, and fidelity. So it was a good opportunity to, to look back. Okay. And the second part of my question, um, being that we really want to emphasize the positive, mm -hmm. Are we going to have to revamp our student handbooks and Eventually, the discipline? districts do find when they get the PBS in place and working well that there are changes that often are made to the student discipline part components of the handbook. So we need to be open to have the student handbook aligned to what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying we're going to throw out the handbook and not have a handbook, but we want to make sure that whatever's whatever they agree to in the school, the handbook aligns to that. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, this is Bonner. Do you know, uh, I mean, you probably do, but <laughs> other districts that have done this and they're in the middle of it or they've already done it and it has succeeded? We do, we know, we know of many districts and actually we're working with, the consultant that's been working with our inclusion task force is actually um, a PBIS uh, trainer and has coached the, the program in many other districts, so he's given us some names and so that we can actually go out and see it in s people in different stages uh, of, of uh, implementing this program. So, but in the area, uh, North Reading Middle School is actively involved in implementing it. Um, there are several schools in Reading who are actively involved. Um, Wakefield has begun to implement that, so I think it's something, a practice that's really catching on because of the focus in all districts on tiered systems of support and this being a component of that. And so have, is there anyone that has gone through the full four to five years and now they're done and they're we just We actually visited and they came here, Wood End Elementary School um, in Reading, and they've been doing this now for three years and collecting and monitoring the data. And the data uh, that they have, the progress, is, was really astounding in terms of not just the, the reduction in disciplinary referrals and discipline, but the actual increase in performance mm -hmm. on statewide assessments and local assessments. Mm -hmm. Pretty dramatic, I was really su surprised. And they haven't done intentionally a whole lot of other things behaviorally except focus on the implementation of the strong tier one supports. They're just now starting to talk about tier two and tier three and, and getting those squared away and 
it's not, like I said, it's not that they don't do any interventions at that level, but the real focus has been on the tier one supports. Mm -hmm. right. so, so has there been a district that has gone through the implementation four or five years? There you? has been Boston Public Schools. Um, I can't remember the whole list, but yes, there has. There are schools that have gone have been doing this for several years, both in Massachusetts but also outside. Of Do we have any? Is there any way to get that information to see how they're doing after they implemented it and have gone through that process yes. four or five years and see I'm, how that, sure that, yes. that has changed their? Uh, yep. so. All right. It sounded like when you were just talking, if. Um, the schools are individually deciding how they'll do this? And so what happens to the other schools who don't participate? So all schools will participate, it's just the, the time frames may take longer. The secondary level I think will take a little bit longer than the elementaries. I think that the early childhood centers and elementaries are, will implement this rather quickly. What we're also doing though is ensuring that there's alignment across the schools on the sides of town. So developmentally, whatever Wildwood does will feed nicely into what Woburn Street does, will feed into what uh, the North does. And even um, Mrs. Gerard at the middle school is looking at what's coming up from both sides and making sure that what they have can align. So that as kids transition from one school to the next school, there's also that consistency. It may just change a little bit developmentally but that, again, the better we do, the easier those transitions are going to be so they have similar expectations similarly stated in the various settings in the school. And it said, um, there was one part in here that said, t it talked about training st uh, teachers at some point? Yes. Train and who would be the, the trainer? Uh, there is a, uh, there is a national organ PBIS organization uh, that's part of the Department of Education, and there are local and regional chapters of PBS trainers. So there are local trainings that happen, sometimes they're in Massachusetts, sometimes they're in Connecticut, uh, but we can also bring trainers in as well to do the training for our teachers. So we would look, really the training is done with the school-wide PBS teams, less so, that, and those folks are responsible for training the rest of the folks in the building. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? What's, uh, what are the next steps on our part to begin moving forward on this, if we are going to move forward on this? Uh, there, I mean, you have um, already, we have funding in the budget for professional development to support the implementation of PBIS. That's already in there as one of the, which is really, I think, as we continue to move forward, just identifying the particular supports, be they staffing supports or um, budgetary resources that are being allocated to this program. But at this point, all we're really doing is just forming those school-wide teams um, and allowing them to have the conversations about what data they're collecting and what data they could be collecting and to begin to have the conversation about what they would like to see their school-wide norms be. And then, like I said, we hope with the resources we have for PD that we'll be providing the training to the members of those teams over the course of the next several months and then the work will begin next year to identify, okay, we have these core values, these norms, what does it look like in terms of expectations? So I think if there's, there's no particular, it's not like it's a curriculum adoption, there's no textbook associated with this. This really is just about implementing good practice when it comes to um, behavioral expectations and behavior management in the schools. Um, how do you envision us getting buy-in from the parents and families? Because I, I know we're, we, these are all good things that we want to do when the kids are here under our care during the day. Not sure what goes on at night mm -hmm. or on the weekends and, and how do we make sure that the good work is that's being done isn't undone yes. later and on. There is a very strong parent-family engagement component to this. And I, for that reason, they advocate that you have a parent on the school-wide team, but also using your PACs and whatever other school councils to be able to help them understand what it is that's happening. Uh, and then through the newsletters that uh, principals send out, continue to write stories for me to continue to talk about that. I did a, um, a recent post on, and I did actually did a monthly article in the newsletter as well about PBIS. So continue to get the word out. I think as we get to that point where we really have those school-wide norms in place when teachers do, when um, schools do their open houses, 
they'll talk about it at the open house and help the parents understand, and then also provide the parents with resources that they can use to help reinforce the behaviors at home and understand what the meaning is when a child comes home with a particular card or a stack of paws or what have you, know that that's a good thing and, and recognize that. Um, there are some districts who uh, eventually put standards on a report card that has something to indicate how students are doing behaviorally, at least sort of at the elementary grade levels. We haven't really talked about that but uh, as an option, but anything we can do to communicate with parents that kids are doing well, these are the expectations that we have, and whatever pa families can do to reinforce that will be helpful. Um, and hopefully, like you said, that the more positive and the positive we're given to the children, the children will go home mm -hmm. wanting to be positive and do the best. Mm -hmm. No matter what family life they have, they'll still want to be a good person, you know, a better yeah. Yeah, I mean, I good choices. Have, I could even envision a scenario where parents decide they want to have an analogous type system in their home where they, mm -hmm. you know, and we could come up with a system that if you at home are giving you know, pause to a, a student, that that too is going to count towards whatever recognition that they're going to get in the school. Um, I'd love to see businesses involved. I'd love to mm -hmm. see a child who does a kind act, you know, at, on, at Market Basket that a cashier would say, that was so nice of you and here's, I'd love to see it be a whole community-wide initiative to support those positive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Candy bar. Candy. 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 I'm just going to give out candy bars. <laughs> Pretty much. Any more questions or comments? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work on the sofa. Very interesting. Yeah. So can we look forward to, like, in a couple of months, like, updates or by the end of the, at the end of the year where everyone We certainly can and, update you at the end of the year. Yes, the so Behavioral Task Force has been intimately involved in their schedule to present to you, I think, sometime either late May or the early oh. June meeting, so they'll talk about that as well. Uh, I feel fortunate that we have gotten the support so far of the behavioral health coordinator position, whatever title we choose for that position, because this person will be instrumental in taking the baton and, and running with it and supporting each of the schools uh, with the implementation of this, these practices. Excellent. Mm -hmm. well, sir. Thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate that. Thank you. Now you're not a visitor, you're a <laughs> participant over here. It's <laughs> interesting. All right. Um, public comment. Do any? Do the girl are you here for public comment? Great, come on up. Would you like to sit here? Would you like to come up too? No. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Not at all, thanks. Hi, could you just tell us who you are? I'm Jessica Lifton, and this is just a comment on the mental health aspect of our school. This is a paper I wrote for English class, and I'd like to read it to you. That'd be terrific, thank you. Imagine for a moment you wake up one day to find out your best friend or your student or your child has tried to commit suicide that night. While you were peacefully asleep, they were consumed with the belief that they would be better off dead. Earlier that day, they were acting a little funny, but you thought nothing of it. They're in the hospital now, getting their stomach pumped and having their vital signs monitored after swallowing a bottle of Tylenol. In 2011, suicide was the second leading cause of death among teens ages 15 to 19. Mental illness is a rising problem among youth, but what is being done about it? Schools could say it's being taught in health classes, but it doesn't hit home on the issue. Schools need to talk more about the problems surrounding suicide, self-harm, eating disorders, and other mental health issues. In our own school, there are students suffering silently day by day. By addressing these mental health issues in a more profound manner to connect with each other as human beings, we can put an end to other problems such as, such as drug and alcohol abuse. Let's start with the Wilmington High School's Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It was found that 12.5% of students reported having hurt or injured themselves on purpose in the past 12 months. That is about 100 students in this very building. 11% of students reported having seriously considered attempting suicide. That is about, in the past 12 months, 
That is about 57 students. Sorry, that was about 88 students. 7.1% have reported attempting suicide in the past 12 months. That was about 57 students. These results are only covering a limited number of countless mental health concerns. One may find these numbers shocking, but if you think of the stress this generation has on them, with the competitiveness of school and college, the pressure placed on them by social media and trying to have a balanced social life with all the school work they get, you'll understand why these numbers are so high. Mental illness, particularly depression, has been presumed to be one of the primary health afflictions of the coming decades. I have personally struggled with mental health issues, including anorexia nervosa, depression, and anxiety. I had suicide, suicidal ideations every single day. I had attempted suicide. Freshman year, I missed three months of school to be treated for my depression and anxiety. Those three months I could have spent in my school with my friends, furthering my education, but instead I spent the second quarter of the school year in the hospital. If I had only learned more about mental illness in school, I wouldn't have had to miss so much of freshman year. If there were at least two assemblies every year addressing mental health illness and coping skills for it and more curriculum surrounding mental health taught in health classes, I know that there would be at least one other person who would not have to miss three months of school. Health classes are mandatory in schools and are constantly being updated in terms of teaching students the value of nutrition and exercise. This is admirable since obesity and diabetes are one of the main health threats for our generation and future generations. But there continues to be a gaping hole in the curriculum when it comes to mental illness. Considering depression is one of the leading causes of chronic illness and the most important this is the leading cause of chronic illness in the, mo in the developed world, it astounds me that we have yet to arm our students with the arguably most important tool to help them direct them throughout their lives, that is, to give young people an insight on their mental health. Personally, my battle with my mental health began when I was in seventh grade. A little 13-year-old girl who didn't know anything about mental health, I was struggling with my body image and ended up starving myself. Of course, I knew that was that I wasn't eating enough thanks to health classes, but I didn't know why I felt the way I did or how to stop it. The summer after seventh grade, I was on my deathbed. 73 pounds, heart rate in the 30s, not able to move without get, becoming dizzy. This is a harsh reality of mental illness, especially anorexia, which is a mental illness with the highest fatality rate. In middle school, I was taught very little surrounding mental health, even though what students are really struggling with at that age is finding themselves. The middle school health curriculum should cover mental illness before drugs and alcohol, since they can, directly, can, they can be directly related to mental health. A leading cause of drug and alcohol abuse is as a coping mechanism for anxiety, bipolar disorder, depression, and other mental illnesses. If someone doesn't know they have a mental health condition, they may turn to drugs to self-medicate. The drugs help to numb the feelings one has associated with their mental, health, with their mental illness. Yes, this does help in the moment, but it is dangerous since on top of the mental health problem, the person then has an addiction to deal with. This might be why some of the 32.2% of Wilmington High School's freshmen, sophomores, and juniors reported having used alcohol in the past 30 days from the 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Survey. If mental health was taught more effectively in schools, students wouldn't be afraid of it and cover it up with these addictive and dangerous behaviors. There is a stigma behind mental illness in which one may think all people with a mental illness are psychotic or dangerous or weird. This is not the case. I'm sure you know at least one person who has a mental illness, but you don't even know it. They may have received treatment at some point, but you aren't able to tell because they are functioning, productive members of society. By teaching students about this using real people, they will be able to learn that the stigma is false and having a mental illness is not shameful. As you can see, mental illness is a growing prob problem among today's youth. It is vital for schools to teach students about mental health, considering that about 50% of lifetime mental illnesses are first displayed by the age of 14. This topic must be covered in a way that students can learn about the different symptoms of mental illness, learn coping skills, and the assurance that asking for help is okay if or when they are struggling. By updating the health curriculum surrounding mental illness to include coping mechanisms for rough times, 
having volunteer speakers come in to talk about their struggles with mental illness and teaching students to recognize warning signs for mental illness, we can help get students on the best path for college and life in general. As a community, we all need to come together to bring attention to this rising issue before the 7.1% of our school who has attempted suicide turns into 10, 15, 20%. These numbers are growing each year, but yet little has been done. This is your chance to help the future generation have the best chance at a long, successful, happy life. Will you take it? I'd just like to start by saying you are the most courageous person I have met in a long time. It took a lot to come. You don't, I'm not sure if you know anybody here. Do you know anybody? For you to come and to present that to us and um, I know we all thank you very much for it. Does anyone have any? Like, uh, I wanted to thank you for your coverage and, and coming in and talk to us. It's, it's important for us as school committee members to hear that. Um, it's a very well written paper and uh, we appreciate it, all of us sitting here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think the Behavioral Task Force has another member. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, we def we've ta actually talked about having a student representative. So, could we get a? Could I get a copy of? Yeah, you can have those. Okay, excellent. In which grade are you in now? I'm a senior. I'm a senior. Can I say something? Yeah. I was just going to say, oh, please, you know, maybe she or anybody else could help us with this. Tell us what would benefit the the children here and the kids, and um, guide us. Yeah, I that think would it's, help us. it's so powerful to hear, and I think we've heard the same thing, that uh, having adults tell kids what to do, what not to do, how to think is not as impactful as having people come in and speak about their struggles and their experiences. And we, are, we appreciate the fact that we have students like yourself who are courageous enough to come and tell their stories and remind us of that very fact. So um, it is something that we are working on. I think, you know, uh, I'm not here to list off the things that we are doing. I think um, we're, what we, I think I heard loud and clear mm -hmm. as I transitioned into this role a year and a half ago that the area of behavioral health and mental health had been neglected. And, uh, you know, I think you've just inspired us to work as fast as we can to, to continue to do the types of things that you're suggesting here. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to your friend for being your moral support. I would recommend her maybe even come back next year and talking to some of the girls because she'll be out of the school, you know, and maybe talking to some girls and telling them their sure. stories, yeah. you know. And to the middle school too. I mean, Same she way. could even go the now school. to the middle school too and tell her. You know, I think, I think they've just invited you to come back <laughs> next year as an alumni <laughs> and be one of our featured speakers if you're so yeah. inclined to do I that. I think that would be really powerful. Yeah. So we'll make sure we have your information. We'll keep in touch with you and follow your success as well as you transition. Do you know where you're headed? Okay. I think you've given all of us, though we all have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, and um, a bunch of us have them in the middle school and some in the high school. And they are, they are tough times, and we realize that. And, but we as adults don't always know how to deal with it. And you just gave us some great ideas. And uh, so we, I can't tell you enough how much we thank you. And, and admire you that you can do this and that you have the courage to do it because it means so much to you. And it does, believe it or not, I know it seems it has been let go and we have not really focused on it at all, behavioral health or mental health. And uh, when the new superintendent came in, that was one of the first things out of her entry plan that, that she talked to us about. And at first we're like, well, I don't know if everybody was, but I've been on here for quite a while and I was like, Huh? When do we ever get into behavior? We do. We're supposed to be academic, and that should be our focus. And then I just sat back and waited. And she's an excellent teacher um, <laughs> because Ms. Delay really got us into this whole um, to even put money in the budget for it and to talk about what ways we could do it. But you've given us a whole new perspective, and we really, really appreciate that. 
and we do want to keep in touch and we'd like to really keep you as part of this. And um, I'm sure at some point the behavioral people could absolutely would have a discussion with yeah. you and yeah. you'd have some great ideas for them. Yeah. I know where so. to find you. <laughs> <laughs> so we really appreciate your time and that you came tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Uh, that was very impressive. Okay. Um, any other public comments? That was great. Um, thank you. Other reports? Oh, Spelling Bee. Yep. WEF Spelling Bee is um, tomorrow. Even if you don't have a team, go and support um, the other teams. It's always a fun event, and um, all the funds go back to Wilmington Schools. So come out and support and have fun. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Um, correspondence? No, no correspondence. Uh, our future meeting dates are April 13th, 2016, and April 27th, 2016. Uh, at this time, we're going to adjourn to executive session from which we will not return. Oh, I don't have the... Sorry, wait a second. Um, I would, yeah, yeah. I'd have us move to enter into executive session for the purpose of conducting strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Do we have a, Mrs. Carroll? So moved. Okay, second, Mr. Mulis. All right, um, alphabetical order here. Um, Mrs. Bonish? Yes. Mrs. Broussard? Yes. Mrs. Carroll? Yes. Mr. Mulis? Yes. And Mrs. Kane? Yes. So we'll adjourn to executive session. <laughs>